Um, so in terms of the plan for today, um, we intend for the webinar to last about an hour, um, but we have allowed a bit of time after that for um, questions um, and for a little bit of run over. Um, I'm going to speak first of all to Camilla Parker, who is the author of the book, and then I'm going to introduce our, our brilliant panel of speakers um, to talk about some of the, the particular issues and topics um, so they can provide their perspectives um, from their specialisms. Um, so um, in relation to the book itself, I think many, if not all of the people who have signed up to this panel discussion will recognise that this is a really complex area of law. Um, and even those of us who perhaps consider ourselves an expert in a certain area find this particular issue really challenging because of the overlapping guidance and rules and, and legislation, which can sometimes seem pretty impenetrable. Um, and Sir James Mumby, who was the former president of the family division, said of this particular area, um, these cases lie at the intersection of three different bodies of domestic law, mental health law, mental capacity and family law, where judicial decision making is spread over a variety of courts and tribunals which by and large are served by different sections of the legal profession, too few of whom are familiar with all three bodies of law. And I think I might go further than that and say it's maybe even five or six, because of course you have special educational needs law and that tribunal, and then you have community care law, which perhaps might end up in, in uh, the administrative court. Um, and so it's with that background that we're really pleased to welcome this really much needed book that fills this important gap in the information available to professionals who work with children and young people that have mental health needs. Um, and I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. Camilla Parker, who is, who is our author. Um, so Camilla, um, for those of you who don't know her background, she's an independent legal and policy consultant, researcher and trainer specialising in mental health, disability and human rights. And much of her work has focused on law and human rights relevant to um, the mental health care of adolescents, which was also the subject of her PhD in law in 2017. And Camilla has been a member of a number of groups, part of independent review for the Mental Health Act, um, and has been a consultant for the Department of Health, where she led on work to revise the children and young people's chapter in the Mental Health Act Code of Practice. Um, she's also a non-practicing solicitor um, and a member of the Law Society's Mental Health and Disability Committee. So Camilla, um, thank you so much again. I have spent my weekend reading um, as much of this as I can, um, but tell us why did you write the book? I think you might be on mute. Sorry. Yes, that's something to we need to get used to. Uh, so thank you very much, Polly. Um, well, in answer to your 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 question, I really have two two main reasons. I mean, the first one is, as you have pointed out, there's a you know huge lack of resources um, on this area. So my first first purpose is really to bridge that gap and to. Um, the book seeks to provide a just a clear and straightforward explanation of the relevant law. But my second purpose in writing the book is to highlight the gaps and the inconsistencies and the areas of potential confusion in this area of law. And that's really with the hope that that's going to galvanise action to address these, these really significant, significant uh, deficiencies. This is needed because... Um, I think the, the term I would use is, is there's been an absence of attention to this area of law. And what I mean by that is that historically, issues relating to children and young people's mental health services have been hugely neglected. And while there have been some very important and positive steps to develop services that can respond to the mental health needs of children and young people and to address the, the years, years of underinvestment in, in this area, the problem about the law that there is a lack of clarity on how the relevant legal frameworks work. Um, and that's, that's something that was raised in, in 1999, the review of the, of the Mental Health Act in 1999, referred to the climate of uncertainty. And despite that, despite the fact that it's been recognised for a very long time that this is a complex area of law that, that raises a lot of concern, 
um, the aspects of the legal side of, of, of the provision of care and treatment for children and young people has largely been ignored. Now, it might well be that the white paper, the forthcoming white paper on the Mental Health Act um, will pick up on some of our, our, our concerns. But my, my actual concern is that that is only really going to be piecemeal. Whereas what we, it seems to me that what we need is we need to have a more comprehensive review of the wide range of law, as you've mentioned, um, Sir James Monby sort of identified some areas, but actually it's far, it goes far, far wider than that. So we really do need to have a comprehensive review of the wide range of law and policy that's relevant to these uh, children and young people who have mental health needs. And at the moment, you know, the problem is the lack of action to date to address these concerns means that practitioners continue to be uncertain about how the law operates, which in, more importantly, in turn, has a significant and very negative impact on children and young people in need of care and support. And so if I may, Polly, I'd like to give um, so you three examples. So I'll keep it to three, uh, but three examples of my concerns about this area of law. And Thank the, you. Most importantly, injustice that this, this, this can cause. So um, the first one is in relation to informal admission. Now, uh, this is an area that is very, very difficult to find information about, but um, on looking at this, it, it would seem that on the data that's available, the majority of under 18s are admitted informally to hospital uh, for mental health care. So what that means is that you're, they're, they're not detained under the Mental Health Act. And it's of course the case that the Mental Health Act should only be used if the child or young person cannot be admitted informally. So the potential, if you like, legal routes for informal admission would be the adolescent's consent, uh, parental consent, or in accordance with the Mental Capacity Act 2005. So they, they are the potential routes. But if those who are making the decisions about the under 18's admission are not clear on how to assess the adolescent's competence, if they're under, 18, under 16 or capacity, if they're 16, 17 year olds, or are uncertain about the, the limits of parental decision-making powers, or they, are not unclear about how to identify whether a deprivation of liberty arises. I really think that informal admission is then going to be highly questionable if, if people do not understand those fundamental aspects to whether or not an under 18 year old can be admitted informally. And that then links to my second, second area of concern, which is a lack of safeguards. So for those under 18s who are admitted informally, there are next to no safeguards under the Mental Health Act. And that's one of the reasons why in my book, I really try to emphasize the importance of the local authorities continuing uh, responsibilities for under 18s who are admitted to, to hospital for psychiatric care. And then there's another area of concern, which is where under 18s are placed out of area. Sometimes it's well over hundred miles away from home, while others are placed in adult psychiatric wards. And this is another area that there's really too little information. We don't know why such placements are being made and how long those placements last. And then the final um, uh, of my three examples of concerns relates to the forthcoming liberty protection safeguards. Now, hopefully some of my, my concerns will be covered in the code of practice, the guidance um, that we're hoping will, will, will be produced in relation to liberty protection safeguards. But thus far, there's a lack of guidance on how these provisions will operate in conjunction with other legal frameworks, such as you've mentioned already, are those with special educational needs, but also looked after children. And moreover, I envisage that there may well be confusion about how the liberty protection safeguards work along, alongside the decision-making role of parents. So this is an area where I do feel that um, Liberty protection safeguards were the, the main issues were, were being looked at were in relation to adults. And I do feel this is another example where um, law, the law reform is, is sort of, if you like, grafting on uh, 16, 17 year olds to, to um, a range of proposals that really pre predominantly focused on adults. Um, so that's kind of an, that's really why I'm saying we do need to have sort of a comprehensive review of the issues relating to to, to under 18s. Um, 
so that there are there are my three three big concerns. I have many more, um, but I thought I'd just keep it to three. Um, so I'd just like finally sort of say at this point to thank you very much, Polly, to uh, to you and the panel and all the participants for, for joining us on this discussion. So thanks. Thank you so much, Camilla. And before we um, I introduce our panel, I wonder if you might be able just to say a little bit about who the book is for. Uh, well, it's for anyone and everyone who's interested in, in the mental health care of under 18s. Um, I've specifically um, thought about those practitioners such as mental health lawyers who will be representing under 18s, those who have been detained on the Mental Health Act and sort of looked at, at the Mental Health Act and th thought about how that applies to under 18 year olds. Um, the uh, sort of discussion around informal admission and, and treatment, well, hopefully that, that's going to be helpful to clinicians, advocates, um, and in fact, it, it goes, those issues really go more broadly than just um, uh, admission to, for, to hospital for psychiatric care. Hopefully that will be useful to anybody with an interest in how the law works in relation to admission to hospital and, and treatment. Um, I, I do hope, I mean, it, it is very much geared towards um, busy legal legal practitioners and hopefully people such as yourself who, who are expert in special educational needs will find it useful. Those who are interested in, in um, the uh, rights of those um, under 18s who are looked after, um, because I, I've I tried to look at the, how uh, the Mental Health Act uh, sort of interrelates or doesn't, as the case may be, with provisions for looked after children and also special educational needs. Um, but I also hope it's going to be useful for advocates. So those without a legal background, I have tried to make it as accessible as possible. Uh, clearly, there are some areas where you do have to get into the complexities, but I've tried to, as, as hard as I can, to, to ensure that, that anybody with an interest will find this, this, this a useful resource. Thank you. Um, and now if if um, our panel could switch on their videos so I can see everybody. Hello. Um, and just by way of introduction and, and who we have here um, this afternoon. So first of all, Steve Broach. Um, Steve is a barrister at 39 Essex Chambers with a particular interest and expertise um, in health, education and social care with a focus on um, children's rights and disability. Um, he is the co-author of um, Disabled Children and Legal Handbook and Children in Need, Local Authority Support for Children and Families, which are also published by the Legal Action Group. Um, we also have um, Camilla Dorling, who is the Head of Policy and Advocacy at Article 39, which is a charity that fights for the rights of children living in state and privately run institutions, including children's homes, mental health in inpatient units, prisons and immigration detention in England. Um, and then um, finally, to offer us a, a clinical perspective, we have um, Dr. Soya Dakras, who is a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist working in the NHS, but also has a perspective as a medical member um, of the as CAMS panel of the Mental Health Review Tribunals. Um, so thank you so much to all of our panellists. Um, we're now going to have time for about half an hour of what I hope will be a really interesting discussion about some of the, the themes and topics that are covered um, in Camilla's book. Um, and so and one of the central themes which Camilla has already spoken about is the lack of safeguards and combined with that in particular the, the high numbers of those children and young people who are informally admitted. I mean, Camilla, I understand that Article 39 have done a lot of work around safeguards for children and young people in this area, and in particular looking at access to advocacy. I mean, what do you see the key issues that young people in this particular cohort face? Hi, thanks. Um, I'm going to start by saying thank you for uh, Camilla and Legal Action Group for involving me in this discussion, but also a huge thank you for my book, because uh, I'm relatively new to this area of law. And uh, I just wish it was out six months ago when I started, because I, I'm, it's so useful and I'm sure it'd be really helpful to a whole range of people working in this area. Um, so yeah, so Article 39 fights for the rights of children in institutional settings. And we've been um, doing some work looking at the experiences of children and young people in mental health inpatient care. 
And we've been doing that by talking to members of our children and young people's advocates network to get a sense of the issues that children are bringing to them and the kind of the, the key concerns. And the, the issue of informal admissions has come up a lot in those discussions. Now we know that about three quarters of children and young people in hospital for mental health reasons are informal patients. But when we've tried, so I've tried through freedom of information requests to get a sense of the basis under which children are being admitted. So whether it's their consent, whether it's parental consent and what local authorities who have responded to those requests just don't have the information. So there's, a, there's a, already a huge gap there in our understanding and even though the Mental Health Act review called for the government to look more into the ability of parents to consult or to consent to admission and treatment for those under 16, we haven't seen any steps to do that. So we know that there's a gap and advocates have raised concerns that this gap and difference in safeguards, for, as Camilla pointed out, for children who are formally detained versus informal patients, um, is a really significant problem, especially when in their eyes, these children are under the same conditions. They're under the same sort of physical or, or security um, conditions. And what they've seen is that many of these children who are informal patients don't really understand what that means. They don't really understand that they what their rights are, that they have a right to leave, how they can exercise that, especially if they're many, many miles away from their homes. Um, some of those children feel a kind of underlying threat that they may be informally informal patients, but if they actually try to leave, that they would be sectioned and they don't realise the process involved with that. Um, and so that's something that advocates have to explain to them how that assessment works. But of course, a fundamental issue is that they don't have the right to advocacy in the first place. So actually, a lot of the, the children we've been talking about are seeing advocates because they've arranged for a, set, for a special drop-in to be available to informal patients, but that's all down to kind of individual contracts. You don't have that kind of clear safeguard and that clear right to information, and that just seems to be very problematic on the whole. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and, um, so from a from a clinical perspective, how are you managing these decisions um, in and decisions about treatment and admission in these informal admission cases? Um, so again, firstly, I'll say thank you for inviting me and um, Camilla, congratulations again for writing the book and thank you for my copy. Uh, very, very helpful indeed. Um, and uh, I, I, I agree with your point, uh, the point that both Camilla have, has made, as well as you, Kamina, about um, the, the, the three quarters of, the, of, of young people are, children and young people are admitted informally. And I think part of that is to do with uh, traditionally in um, the CAMS age group, uh, there has been um, a significantly lesser proportion of our patient groups being subjected to formal um, frameworks of detention as compared to adults. And that has historically been the case with parents having uh, a, a significant role to play in the uh, treatment uh, that is given to children and young people. And that is, I think, partly culturally also um, emphasized because of the systemic perspective that is always kept in camps, which I think is a very useful thing to have in camps. Um, but I think what uh, uh, when, when I think about the, the significantly larger number of young children and young people who are admitted informally, um, I think that uh, my experience of working with inpatient youth, because I work in the community, I'm a community CAMS consultant, uh, is the subtleties of difference that is that that is evident in the intervention plans uh, derived for children who might be under detention children and young people who might be admitted under detention to children and young people who might be admitted informally and whether and and clinicians trying to come up with a scheme in which there are 
some restrictions on liberty as compared to a deprivation of liberty. So there would be a, a, a difference, I think, in the in how complete and effective the control of the hospital is over the care and treatment of, of, of some young people and some children as compared to others. So an example would be that there might be a, a, a young person, so the door to the unit might be locked uh, for safety purposes, but children who are not how are informal uh, have more access to going outside, will have more trips outside, will have more planned activities that are ongoing as compared to children and young people who might not uh, be admitted informally. But I also think one of the, whilst this is about psychiatric care, I think one of the things that's very clear to me as a clinician is we also need to think about this as not just happening in it's psychiatric units, but also in acute hospitals, because um, there will be a, a significant amount of information and data now available about the high proportions of children and young people presenting in crises to and various mental health and psychiatric crises to acute hospitals and pediatric wards, uh, where they might uh, end up staying or being treated for a considerable period of time. And uh, the importance of ensuring that the intervention that's happening for those children and young people in those units is also thought about carefully about whether the intervention amounts to a deprivation of liberty or not and how decisions are made who makes those decisions i think that's really important and i can see a significant from my own clinical experience i can see a significant increase exponentially over the last few years for, of my pediatric colleagues, and not just pediatric medics, but also uh, pediatric MDT colleagues and colleagues working in the emergency department about wanting to learn about the different legal frameworks that are uh, available to make sure that what we do when we work with children and young people is, is lawful. So I don't know whether that answers your question, Polly, but it's a, it's a much more mixed and nuanced uh, 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 issue. And I think something, the point Kamina made about the, the need for regular advocacy, I think is really important because these are emotionally fraught situations. And my experience is however much you explain, or you think you've explained to the child in front of you or the youngster in front of you and their parents about what informal admission means, what are their rights within informal admission or within detention, the emotional fraughtness of the situation might mean that that information needs to be rehearsed and explained over and over again, repeatedly, to make sure that that's truly understood by, by our patients. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. It's really interesting to hear that perspective. And I think it, it seems key being able to identify when a child or young person is deprived of their liberty and then which legal framework that puts them into is really important. And even as a practitioner and seeing the way that the case law has developed through cases like ReD, and then having to look at not just is the person deprived of their liberty, but is there parental consent or and could parents consent to this? It adds this whole layer of complexities um, for, you know, if, if I struggle as a lawyer, it must be even more difficult for consultants and people on the ground to understand these things. I mean, Camilla, to what extent, I mean, I know you've talked a little bit about your worries about the liberty protection safeguards, but to what extent do you think that the liberty protection safeguards will help with some of these problems? Um, well, I, I, I suppose that the first first aspect is I think what I hope that this will give um, children's services and those working, say, in, in transitions an opportunity to have training around the Mental Capacity Act and the Liberty Protection Safeguards, which perhaps they they uh, it wasn't recognised that they needed to have that when the Mental Capacity Act was 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 brought in. So I hope. Hope there will be it, 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 an opportunity for children's services and adult services to work to actually do some training and work together and thinking about how these new provisions will um, are, are going to operate. And um, in relation to uh, psychiatric care, um, such the what we know of of how they're going to work is that there's a potential for if if an under eighteen year old sorry 16, 17 year old is deprived of their liberty as a result of being admitted into a psychiatric unit, 
such as with where you have with deprivation of liberty uh, safeguards with adults, they're, 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 you, there's a potential in certain circumstances for using the liberty protection safeguards, but only if there's no objection to uh, by the, the young person to, to, to their, their care arrangements. Uh, so again, um, that is something that we need to have guidance on. And I suppose to some extent, uh, one, of, one of my concerns about the liberty protection safeguards um, was that it, the, 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 it was really understood as being something that was filling a gap for 16, 17 year olds. And um, from the legal perspective, there was no gap. What we have in relation to the legal framework for authorizing a deprivation of liberty for under 18s, doesn't matter how old they are, it's that it's either in a mental health case, it's either the Mental Health Act or it's a court needing to apply to a court. Now, which court that will be will depend on the circumstances and the setting. Um, so usually if there's a deprivation of liberty in a psychiatric unit, you would be using the Mental Health Act. You'd only be going to the court if for whatever reason, the uh, criteria for detention and the Mental Health Act weren't met. But in other settings, um, you um, have Section 25 of the Children Act, which covers secure, um, secure children's homes. And uh, you have then the Court of Protection, which would be relevant to uh, young people uh, who lack capacity and their care arrangements amount to a deprivation of liberty. And then you have the inherent jurisdiction of the court, which is in effect, you know, the court, the high court being able to authorise uh, the deprivation of liberty of an under 18 year old. So those exist. Um, it wasn't that they, there was a gap. And I think that it really was um, something that people thought that liberty protection safeguards were, were going to fill a, a, a much needed gap. What, what, but that's not the case. There was that, there is that very clear requirement. It's either the Mental Health Act that authorizes the deprivation of liberty or you need to go to court. I think the issue was, the concern was that there were insufficient applications being made to uh, go to court. Um, and, and therefore the liberty protection safeguards, which is in effect, it's an administrative means of authorizing deprivation of liberty. So the idea was that this was going to help because then um, you wouldn't have the, the expense of going to court and that you wouldn't have the distress that that might cause to young people and their families. So. I think, yes, that uh, to that extent, I think they're helpful, but um, to, to, uh, the idea that they were filling a legal gap, I think is, is, is one that, that does need to be corrected. Um, my concern about that is first of all, in terms of mental health care, um, are people going to be clear about how you decide whether between the Liberty Protection Safeguards and the Mental Health Act, what do we mean by your objection? Um, in other areas, I, I'm also concerned about um, the uh, lack of guidance around how this is going to operate alongside uh, care orders, um, how that's going to work in relation to, to um, under 18s with special educational needs, sort of looking at their education, health and care plans. So there's a lot that we need to, to look at. But the other really, really crucial thing is that it's only going to be engaged if people have a good understanding of when a deprivation of liberty arises. Um, now, in relation to 16, 17 year olds, the, 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 the Supreme Court has actually been incredibly helpful as they've, they've clarified it. Once you're saying a young person is confined, <laughs> i.e. the restrictions go beyond what you would normally expect to see for a, a, a young person of that age, then the parents can't consent to that confinement and therefore there will be a deprivation of liberty um, if subject to the state being involved. But in the cases we'll be looking at, for example, psychiatric settings, uh, residential schools, children's homes, the state's going to be involved. So it would be about saying, let's look at the restrictions. How do they compare to what the kind of restrictions you'd expect to see on this 16, 17, 16, 17 year old without the kind of disabilities that we're saying justify these kind of restrictions? And if you say it's gone beyond that, then there will be a deprivation of liberty. Their parents cannot consent to that. And therefore we then need to have that authorized. So to that extent, if that then picks up on young people whose uh, care arrangements have given rise to a deprivation of liberty and that hasn't, hasn't been authorized, then yes, I think that's helpful. Um, but I do have a lot of concerns about how the, the, these are going to operate. 
And I, I, I think it's going to be important that we look at, at these, these um, arrangements alongside the role of parents, because they're not going, they don't override the, the role of parents. Um, and I, I, I think one of the things that's going to be important, and again, this is not really a, a, um, about mental health settings, but for example, if you had uh, um, parents who were, did not want their, their child to be placed, say, in re at a residential school or, or, or children's home, um, the liberty protection safeguards don't override their, their, their current rights to, to object to, to that. What would need to happen is the local authority would need to seek, um, um, most particularly, I think they, they'd have to go to, to seek a care order uh, to have the authority to override the views of the parents. Um, parents aren't included very much in liberty protection safeguards, um, but they should be involved in, in discussions around the, the, the arrangements. But almost like at the first stage, we need to have clarity about whether or not a young person can be placed away from home when the parents are not, are not agreeing to that. In a mental health world, you're likely to, that you're likely to be using the Mental Health Act for the reasons I've just ex explained. But I think this is an area that needs to be looked at in relation to other settings. Thank you. I know what an enormous question that was that I just asked you. So thank you so much <laughs> for explaining it so clearly. Um, another area um, or another focus of concern in the book is about out of area placements. Um, and I... Um, wanted to um, ask Sawyer, first of all, just briefly from your perspective to say, why is it that children and young people are being sent so far away from their families and their homes? Gosh, uh, I, I think it is. Um, so I know when my patients get placed far away from, from where I work and where they live, it's, a real, it's really difficult for them, it's difficult for their families, it's difficult for the peer relations that they have, and it's difficult for us as clinicians to continue maintaining um, a contact with them and ensuring a, 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 a safe um, and, a pro, and, and an appropriate discharge back into the community. And um, I think the biggest reason I would see would be um, the the significant lack of so there are it, it's almost like uh, we the community clinicians the young person child young person and the parent and the inpatient teams have to balance a lot of different factors to make sure that they are placed in the most appropriate unit. Um, uh, I think there is a significant shortage of beds um, in general. Um, so very often we have. Um, messages from NHS England coming through. Um, if I'm on call on a week on a week and uh, during a week, uh, I always dread getting that message on a Thursday evening that says um, currently no PICU beds available at all, which makes my um, stomach drop because thinking, gosh, what what are we going to do over the weekend if something uh, a PICU bed is needed uh, or something of that sort? But I I, I also think there is. Uh, because NHS England is involved in all the tier four uh, provision for children and young people at present, except for really specialist services such as uh, forensic camp services. Um, there are the new care models collaboratives that work now in most areas where the uh, community and inpatient teams come together within that area to try and see whether we can keep children and young people as local as possible when they need tier four admissions. And sometimes with the best will in the world, that's absolutely not possible. And that might range from uh, a variety of different reasons uh, from the units within a particular patch not being able to accommodate that young person because of the expertise that's needed for that particular presentation to the significant clinical issues within the local units. So there might be a number of different factors which increases the risk in the unit, uh, not just for the young person going in, but maybe for the other young people within the unit. There might be staffing issues that might lead us to then have to look for beds outside of the area. And then there might be some very specialist placements that inevitably means that a child or a young person is placed um, outside the area. So. I think in the book, Camilla mentions CETRs, which are care, education, and treatment reviews. And 
I'm afraid to say, so these are, I mean, all children, young people who need this type of provision of uh, especially vulnerable amongst the vulnerable groups that we work with. But I think children and young people with um, significant in needs in the, in, in the context of intellectual disability or having uh, uh, developmental diagnoses such as autism uh, are especially vulnerable because if we think about having to admit a young, a young, a child or a young person uh, uh, with that diagnosis or set of diagnoses to an inpatient unit, we have to make sure that we are trying to admit them to the best possible, the most appropriate yeah. unit that's available, and that can Thank be you. really difficult. Thank you. Um, and Steve, I wonder if I could bring you in now. I, these are really difficult cases when, when children, sometimes very young children are cased really far away from home. And we've heard a lot about the reasons behind that. But what legal tools do we have in those sorts of cases? Thank you, Polly. And thanks for having me, Legal Action Group. And thank you, Camilla, for writing this. It's so hugely needed. It will be extremely well thumbed, I'm sure by all lawyers uh, practicing in this area and hopefully uh, non-lawyers too. I, I confess to Polly when we were doing the prep for this talk, that earlier on in my career, I did wonder if there was some kind of CAMS Act out there somewhere that I just hadn't come across because the law in this area seemed to be in a complete mess and all over the place. Uh, and that's sadly because it is. And thankfully Camilla has pulled it all together and put it in one place so that uh, all of us can have a better understanding of what the law requires. So I really do think it is uh, essential reading. The, the question that I've been asked, the police just asked me, is about routes to challenge. And it's very important to keep in mind, as Camilla mentioned already, the possibility of best interests challenges to decision making in relation to young people and their placements, uh, where a NHS trust or another body is willing to fund um, more than one placement the court can be asked to adjudicate on any kind of best interest dispute. The more difficult issue is where they're not willing to fund more than one placement or where there is, it's said to be only one placement available. And how, how do you challenge that? And the answer has to be judicial review, which is people may well know is the process in the high court, in the administrative court of reviewing the lawfulness of decisions or, or actions by public bodies or their policies. Judicial review though is, is a blunt instrument. Uh, it can be extremely effective in terms of getting very quick remedies and relief. But the court doesn't concern itself with the merits of the decision, merely with its legality, whether it's been properly taken and ultimately, if it has been properly taken, whether it's a reasonable and proportionate decision. And if there genuinely is only one place for the child or young person to go, it's very unlikely the administrative court is going to interfere. I think I have the ability to share my screen and I thought I might just show people a case that's directly relevant to this, which was a case that was brought by um, the family of a young woman in Wales who was sent um, all the way to the south coast of England because of uh, a lack of services in the local area. So it was said, as we see, she was sent 230 miles away to, to Brighton and the claim that was brought uh, in relation in behalf of Claire was that the Welsh ministers had failed to plan effective services in Wales. So the judicial review actually wasn't about the individual placement for Claire Dyer. It was about the strategic planning of mental health services in Wales. And that claim failed. But of course, judicial review is, is incredibly fact sensitive. And I think it's important people keep in mind the possibility of judicial review challenges while recognising that the bar for any kind of claim like that is, is set very high. Um, also important to keep in mind the availability of legal aid. Um, Polly knows a lot more about this than me, but uh, I think we can both say that legal aid is an extremely complex area and very difficult to grapple with, but it does still run for all judicial reviews if the person is financially eligible and if their lawyers say the case has sufficient merit. So it is possible, and frequently we are instructed uh, using legal aid to challenge decisions on behalf of the kind of vulnerable young people that, that Siog was describing a moment ago. So it certainly is possible to, um, to bring claims. But what I would stress is the need to get expert advice 
as quickly as possible, because amongst other issues with judicial review, yeah, there's a very short timeline. Uh, you have to bring the claim promptly and no later than three months from the decision you're challenging. And often, of course, in these cases, you'll have to bring it potentially overnight if you're trying to challenge a, a placement decision. So uh, you do need to get expert advice as quickly as, as you can from solicitors, probably, who have the right legal aid contract. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say before I ask Camilla? No, please. No. Camilla, did you want to say anything on this particular point? Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, draw attention to the, the issue relating to uh, people with learning disabilities and autism. And, and the, 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 this point is, is, um, is sort of broader than just under 18 year olds. But um, um, anyone who's interested and in, see from some chats that uh, the, the chat that some people are, are particularly interested in, in, in this group. And um, it might be worth having a look at the, the Joint Committee on Human Rights report around the, the use of uh, seclusion and restraint for young people with, with uh, lead, uh, learning disabilities and autism. And uh, they raised a, a really important point about the use of the Mental Health Act. Uh, under Section 3, the treatment has to be appropriate, so it's called appropriate treatment. Now, that, that is a very, very broad concept. Um, and certainly, I think those representing people before tribunals will know that when if you might challenge that, as, as uh, you say, it's the treatment, whether the treatment uh, in hospital is appropriate, um, may not get very far, but I think it's very interesting that the Joint Committee on Human Rights have, have really questioned whether or not detaining people with learning disabilities and autism in psychiatric units where they have had evidence of, of actually the, the care and treatment making people worse rather than better. Um, so I, I, I would be very interested in, in, in colleagues' view on whether or not that was something that, that was worth pursuing. I, I should say you know, that the huge caveat is that that is a very broad, it, it's, it's given a very broad interpretation, but I do think if you're getting to the point when you're saying the uh, care and treatment being given to these um, little group of people, whether they're under 18s or adults, is, is actually not only not, not helping, but making, making the situation worse. I think, think that's something that, that's worth exploring. Thanks, um, Camilla. And um, I was also troubled to read about the very high rates of children and young people who are being placed in adult wards. Um, and Camilla, if I could come to you first, is this something that Article 39 have looked at at all? Um, it is, it is. And it's, it's a really striking example, I feel, of where, despite there being an existing duty to ensure a child is placed in an age-appropriate environment, and despite the government four years ago committing to eliminating the inappropriate use of adult wards there just doesn't seem to have been there doesn't seem to have been any progress in that area and almost the opposite so if we look at statistics for 2019 to 20 and this is in Camilla's book we've we've got 592 so nearly 600 children admitted to adult wards which is nearly three times as many as the previous year it was 196 children in the year before. And we're collecting that information. Great that we're collecting it. Um, but then to someone, again, who's relatively new to this area, it begs the question of, of but, and, and now what? And I think linked to that is, of course, the issue that we don't necessarily, we might have the information on the numbers, but I'm not sure we have the information on the circumstances around those admissions. Um, although we have had the Care Quality Commission note that it's in part going to be because demand for bed, beds outstrips availability, which has already been touched on. Um, so I don't have the answer to that, but we've got Article 37C of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child makes very clear that if a child's deprived of their liberty, they should be separated from adults unless it's in their best interests. Um, and and this is a clear kind of breach of that. So it really kind of, again, to someone coming into this, it feels like such an urgent issue, and but, but not enough being being done to address it. Thank you. Um, Steve, did you want to add anything on this? Simply that the scenario that Camilla has just outlined is exactly where judicial review could be a useful remedy, because it's so clearly unlawful. 
there's always exceptions, but generally speaking, it's so clearly unlawful to place children on adult wards that um, it begs the question, why haven't more judicial review claims been brought? We may come on to that a little later, but any competent community care or mental health solicitor, I'm sure would immediately see that there's a potential judicial review there. And what we need is to get those children legal, high quality legal advice as quickly as possible. Thank you, Steve. Um, and Steve, I, I did want to come to you and ask um, uh, about another theme, but just before I do, I wonder, Camilla, if there was anything else you wanted to say about adult wards and children being placed on adult wards before I moved on. Uh, well, there's always something to say about it because I think it's actually disgraceful that this um, is still happening. Now, uh, you know, there may be a few situations where it, it could be appropriate. You might, for example, have a, a, a young young uh, mother and uh, placing her on a mother and baby unit might be appropriate. Um, you might have, um, yeah, so she can stay with, uh, the, the, she and, and the baby can, can keep uh, stay together. You might have a, an under 18 year old who's about to be 18. Um, they are very exceptional circumstances. Um, and, and there also may be situations where there is nowhere else. <laughs> so this is urgent. And uh, the only place that, they, uh, that the young person can be uh, admitted to is an adult ward. That again, that's an emergency. And that should, that should be a matter of, of, of uh, days, if not hours, that they're, that they're on an adult ward. Um, the, pro the issue is, I mean, there, there was a huge amount of very, very good work undertaken um, post the uh, 2007 Mental Health Act, which brought in this provision saying, uh, you know, trying to in ensure that under 18s are not inappropriately admitted to, to adult wards. But there's very little information about it. I mean, you can see that the numbers are rising and it does seem that if you're know, just sort of doing on the calculation that some of those young people are on the ward for a quite, you know, quite a long time. I mean, I think probably, you know, it, it probably will depend, but um, the idea is that, that, that the CQC or the CQC is, is notified um, uh, within, if, if there's an under 18 year old is on an adult ward for 48 hours or more. I think generally speaking, the CQC is informed about that um, beforehand. And I think that, that the CQC will take, try to take action to, to ensure that the young person is, is moved to, to a more appropriate place if, if that is, um, which would what what would should generally be be needed, but my concern is that we we haven't got information about why they're on, on, they're placed on those adult wards, and uh, my concern is for a, a majority of them it's because there's there's insufficient resources in the you know, available for them. Uh, we need to understand that because um, that's going to be absolutely crucial. Um, in, this provision was to ensure that under 18 are not inappropriately admitted, but unless we know why they've been admitted, we don't know how, you know, how, how to make it better. And um, that's something, I, I, another area I feel very strongly about that's gone under the radar. We, the, as as Kamena has been highlighting, the, the information is out there, but you have to be quite keen to, to, to try and get it. But we haven't got the reasons for, for that, uh, those admissions, nor how long are the, those young people are, are, are placed in, in adult wards. So that is something that, that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Um, and so Steve, picking up on another one of the themes of Camilla's book um, and the interface between mental health law and then all these other legal duties and legal rights of, of, of children with, with mental health needs. Um, so special educational needs, looked after children. Um, what are local authorities continuing duties to children and young people once they're in a hospital? Does it just stop there? No. Well, I, Holly, as you very well know, it, the answer to your question is no, of course it doesn't. And I need the entire length of this webinar to do justice to that uh, profoundly important question. I'll just emphasise a couple of absolutely key points. Firstly, special educational needs, of course, the, a very large number of the cohort of children and young people we're describing will have special educational needs. Most should have an education, health and care plan. Perhaps many will not. And it's vitally important that local authorities don't lose touch with children and young people who may be in um, hospital for mental disorder. And certainly those who have an education, health and care plan, their education must continue. Also equally importantly, and I'll share my screen again, if I may, just a moment, uh, the local authorities' obligations to uh, visit those who are in 
hospital for mental health problems, which is, we think uh, as a group, hugely under-recognised as an area of law. And we need to do something about that. So sections 85 and, and 86 of the Children Act 1989 require local authorities to visit children who are in NHS and independent hospitals amongst other residential settings. And there's this statutory guidance that people can hopefully now see published in 2017, November 2017, uh, dealing with those statutory visits. And, and the question I would put to, to those attending today is how often does this actually happen? How often do those particularly vulnerable group of children and young people get visited by the, the relevant local authority? And of course, as you would expect, Camilla has covered this in the book uh, as paragraphs 7.55 onwards. I was also doing my homework. And it's a really fantastic summary of uh, this very complicated area of law in terms of the overlapping obligations of local authorities and in particular, the, for, for present purposes, the visiting obligations. And so I would commend those 40 odd paragraphs of Camilla's book to anyone who's at all interested in what the local authority ongoing responsibilities uh, are. Uh, and we probably need to write the, the book that expands that to, to full length to really do justice to it. But as a starting point, let's make sure that no child or young person uh, with mental health problems who is in uh, any kind of inpatient setting uh, is left unattended by the local authority and that these visiting obligations are, are fully complied with. Thank you, Steve. Um, so before we now go to some questions from the audience, um, I wonder if I could just ask each of you in as briefly as possible, because I'm aware of time, but if you were able just to choose one area which you see as the biggest challenge or the biggest barrier to um, the, the legal and wider rights of children and young people um, in this cohort being realised, what would that be? And I'll start with Soya, if that's okay. Um, I think it's a shame, Polly, that I can have only one wish. Um, I think, uh, but I think what I would want to wish for is to have a much better coordination between local authorities and CAM services, especially in the community, uh, with provision of um, intensive support and care that might actually try and obviate the need for admission for uh, not all, but a proportion of the children and young people who are sent to hospital. And I think we they can, can, they can have better continuity of all the other domains in their life that they need to kind of continue progressing in rather than having to go into hospital. You're muted, Polly. Thank you. I almost got to the end of the talk without doing that. Um, uh, Kamina. Um, I mean, I, I, I think for it's the, a huge barrier to children and young people exercising their rights is understanding their rights in the first place. Um, and so it's just so much work needed to ensure that children and those who support and care for them understand what their rights are, how they might be upheld. Um, and that, and as Zoya pointed out earlier, that's an ongoing process. That's not simply you've given you're given some information on admission and then it's all it's all fine. What we, we heard from advocates was the need to repeatedly check in and repeatedly kind of share information and and ensure that those who needed support could get it whenever they want it. So part of that has to be uh, also access to information, access to advocacy, access to legal advice, um, all in the round. Um, I, can I make a really quick, slightly policy wonky point as well, is that I just, and this is the point that Camilla makes in her book, I really just feel that we need greater understanding of the experiences of children and young people as well. And so much of that is about data. It's about not just knowing the numbers, but knowing why children are placed on adult wards, knowing how far away they're placed from their homes, knowing how these decisions are being made so that we can, can, can continue to interrogate that and continue to make some kind of progress. Um, and also we really need to hear the voices of children and young people um, who have experience of those settings. And that's something that Article 39 will hopefully do more work on in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Steve, what would yours be? It's the gulf between these children and young people and the lawyers that can help them 
in my view. Uh, a child who's experiencing a mental health crisis is not realistically going to be ringing up a solicitor and asking for legal advice. So we need effective advocacy, we need brokerage, we need support for children, young people and families to get to the right lawyers at the right time as quickly as possible so that if any rights violations are going on, whether it's being sent miles out of the area or being accommodated in an inappropriate setting or being in hospital at all, uh, they can get the advice they need to challenge that. And my concern is that we're not supporting access to effective legal advice quickly enough. And there's a, a, a constellation of reasons for that that we haven't got time to go into now. But if I could change one thing, it would be to smooth that pathway so that children, young people and families, but children, young people first, can get to the right lawyers at the right time. Thank you. And finally, Camilla, what, what would you say? Um, well, it's very tricky to come up with with one thing, and, and I suppose I'm going to cheat a little bit because I, I'm going to say as a first step, you know, we, we, we need to address the abs what I've called the absence of attention to, to these issues. And we uh, the other thing is that we need to work together. Uh, I mean, the book I've written really um, is very much uh, um, thanks to many, many people who spent time talking to me about issues that I haven't understood and wanted to understand better. I've had questions raised to me during training events that I haven't been able to, you know, to answer and I've gone and thought, okay, that's a really interesting point. And, and uh, it's really, I, I can't sort of emphasize enough that this is an area that I don't think any one person has the full knowledge. And, and on the other side, lots of people have, have um, a knowledge and understanding of key issues. And I think it's about us working together to try and, and resolve some of these things. And that's, that's uh, the, the, it has been so neglected. People have paid so little attention to, to these, these group of under 18 year olds who need, who, have, who are rather considered to need inpatient psychiatric care. Whether they all do is another matter. And that goes back into what, what services are available in the community. So I think it really is about us working together and to keep, keep um, you know, the momentum going. And if I might, if, if anybody, I really would welcome comments from anyone. So please, I would see there's lots of lots of discussion uh, on the chat. So I'd really uh, have a look at that. But please do contact me if you've got questions or, or, or comments on, on any of the issues, because this is hopefully just going to be the beginning. Thank you so much, Camilla. Um, we that takes us to half past one. Um, I think all of us, I could certainly spend the rest of the afternoon here talking about these things. And I know, you know what, what we've hoped to have done today is just to touch on some of the themes and the issues rather than be able to go into many detail. And of course, that's very much what Camilla's book does. Um, there was just one question that I wanted to pull out from all of the, the great discussion in the chat. And that was about the child's own views or the child young person's own views views and how they play a part in this process because we've talked about capacity we talked about deprivation of liberty but what but I think we what we haven't done is just talked about the child's own views and how they can be be, be um, brought to the fore um, just in kind of 30 seconds maybe if there's anything that any of you would like to say on that particular point um Camina I wonder if I might start with you um because I know that's something that article 39 are, are really passionate about and then the other speakers if you did want to say something about that just take yourselves off mute so I know um yes no I mean I don't have I don't have great answers about how it's achieved, but it is just has been really striking that there hasn't there hasn't been much work done to really, although not recently, to really kind of capture the views um, and experiences of children and people and what they think needs to change to improve the system. Um, and we were, uh, as an organisation, hoping to do that this year. And uh, as for many, best laid plans got derailed by um, COVID-19 and, and thinking about how we were going to try and engage. Um, but certainly, hopefully, in the, the coming years, we're going to try and do that and really, and to make sure that as well, as we, as we begin to see sort of possible changes to law and policy, if we have a white paper, if we have um, new guidance, that children are kind of central to feeding back on that and, and, and seeing what, what they think um, 
needs to change. So that's and, kind of broader. No, that's helpful. And I noticed in the chat, the mental health um, tribunal are gathering feedback from CAMS patients about their experiences of the mental health tribunal. And so that will be very interesting to see. Um, Camilla, I will let you have the final word um, on this before I, I close. Thank you. Uh, well, I just from a sort of like thinking about it from a legal perspective, I mean, quite often you're, you, we're told about, uh, for, particularly for under 18s, you know, we're, we're doing this in, in the child's best interest. Um, but from a human rights perspective, best interest includes the, you know, you, in determining best interest, uh, very much uh, central to that is the child's uh, wishes and feelings. And that is, is an area that I think thus far hasn't really been looked at sufficiently uh, by the courts. Uh, for example, uh, when looking at deprivation of liberty of under under 16s, um, without going into all the details about ha uh, the the kind of the case development, but thus far, I think there's been insufficient attention given to looking at the views of the child, and uh, that is something that that needs, I think, needs to happen when looking at the, these these legal points. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for, um, for all of your time and speaking um, and sharing your thoughts on all of this. I would um, like just to hand over to Carol Storer from the Legal Action Group um, to say a, a few words. Thanks, Polly. Um, a very few words indeed. Um, most importantly, thank you to Dr. Camilla Parker, the author of this book, and to all the panellists uh, Kamina, Steve and Suyuk for a fantastic discussion, beautifully well chaired by Polly. So um, thank you. And it's very good to see the comments in the chat room that people have found this interesting. And, and thank you to everyone who's participated and the comments in the chat are very, um, very useful. And we'll be looking at them and Camilla can, can keep an eye on them for, for future editions of the book, Camilla. Um, I just want to say something about Legal Action Group. We published the book. We're an access to justice charity. We produce books, we produce a magazine, we run training and events. Um, a big shout out to our publishing director, Esther Pilger. I don't know if I can persuade her to come to put her camera on so we can see her. She can give everyone a wave. Yeah, she may, may be willing to do that. Thank you to Esther, fantastic um, publishing director and tremendously um, helpful. Uh, all authors just rave about how good it is to have her editing and helping with their books. So thank you to Esther. And I mean, what um, Camilla said at the beginning about, you know, this book is a straightforward explanation. It highlights confusions and deficiencies in the law. Steve talked about the importance of you know, what do you do with when there are rights violations? And that's really what access to justice, what legal action group is about. This is why we do what we do as a charity. So thank you to everyone. Um, a last thank you to Joe Walters, who's a, a freelancer. Um, Joe's helped us move our events online. Um, and I make the point that she's a freelancer because we do highly recommend her. And it's been nerve wracking moving our events online. And I've found this fascinating today. I was a practicing solicitor. This is not my area of law, but I mean, just the clarity that this book gives and pulling together the disciplines is so important. So thank you to everyone. I hope I haven't missed anybody out. And don't forget that you, we will follow this up and repeat what the discount code is. So buy the book, buy lots of copies, talk to, I mean, seriously, talk to us if you want to buy lots of copies. And just fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. And I think, Polly, have we covered everything? I'll pass back to you to say goodbye. That's it. Thank you, everybody, again. Thank you so much, Carol. Bye-bye.